Hello Year 10. In this video I'm going to go through the key quotations from Macbeth that link to the theme of power. By this point you should have a good understanding of the plot and the main characters in the play. If not, it would be a good idea now to quickly go back over your plot summaries and double check that you know what happens when, because then this video will be much simpler to follow. Before we start, make sure you've got pen and paper to make notes. And if you've got highlighters and you've got your copy of the play, it would be a really good idea if you highlight all of the quotations that I'm going to go through in this video in one colour so that when you go back through your notes and back through the play when you're revising, you know that all of the quotations that you've highlighted in blue or pink or green relate to the theme of power. OK, so I'm going to go through the play chronologically, starting with Act 1. The second time we hear Macbeth's name is when King Duncan and the captain are talking about Macbeth in battle. The captain is telling Duncan how fearlessly and ferociously Macbeth and Banquo fought against the Norwegian king. And King Duncan uses adjectives like valiant and worthy uh, to describe Macbeth. So this shows that he's very impressed with him and he holds him in very high esteem. And he decides to give Macbeth a new title as Thane of Cawdor. A Thane is a lord and Cawdor is an area in Scotland. So he's awarded Macbeth for his bravery by giving him land. And this and land means power, especially when this was set in the 11th century. This is summarised in the rhyming couplet at the end of Act 1, Scene 2, when King Duncan says, go pronounce his present death. So the death he's talking about here is the previous Thane of Cawdor who betrayed King Duncan and with his former title, Greet Macbeth. This is a rhyming couplet because the end of the two lines rhymes. We've got death and Macbeth. In Act 1, Scene 3, Macbeth and Banquo are riding back from the battle. This is a really important scene because it is the first time that Macbeth appears on the stage. Up until this point, he's only been spoken about by other characters. It's equally integral to the plot because this is when we hear the prophecies. Macbeth is told that he's going to become Thane of Cawdor and then he's going to become king. Now, the audience already know that Macbeth will become Thane of Cawdor, but this news has not yet reached Macbeth. So Macbeth doesn't believe that even this is going to happen. And then equally, he doesn't believe that he's going to become king. What the witches say to Macbeth is explicit and straightforward. Whereas they use more vague and ambiguous language when they turn to Banquo. And they say that Banquo is going to be lesser than Macbeth and greater. And that he will get kings, as in his children, his sons will become king. But Banquo himself will not become king. This vague juxtaposition in lesser than Macbeth and greater is, of course, referring to the fact that Banquo is going to be seen as a noble and respected character throughout the play. Whereas Macbeth, despite the fact that he gains total power over Scotland in his title as king, he falls into disrepute by the end of the play. So that's why Macbeth is greater, um, sorry, that's why Macbeth is lesser than Banquo. So this is perhaps referring to Banquo's moral victory by the end of the play. And also linking on to the second uh, prophecy to Banquo, thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. This is a great victory because it was very important 
for your bloodline to carry on if you were king. If you were king, you would then want sons to become king and then their sons become king, etc, etc, etc. So your name and your bloodline lives on. And this is called the law of primogeniture, where property and position are passed down from father to eldest son. Now, an audience might argue that upon first hearing prophecies, Macbeth doesn't believe them and isn't too worried about what they might mean. But it isn't until he becomes Thane of Cawdor in the following scene that this seed of ambition is planted in Macbeth's mind. And he starts thinking about how he might seize the throne, how he might gain this power. And he starts thinking about regicide, which means the act of killing a king. By Act 1, Scene 4, Macbeth has learnt that he is, in fact, Thane of Cawdor, and then he really starts to plot and think about how he is going to gain the throne and become king. He also learns that Malcolm, who is the eldest son of King Duncan, has been made the Prince of Cumberland. And upon hearing this news, Macbeth said, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else owe a leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. So the stage direction for this is an aside, which means that Macbeth and the audience are the only people who can hear this. So even though there are other characters or other actors on the stage, they cannot hear what Macbeth is saying. And that's because he is saying that Malcolm being the Prince of Cumberland is just another obstacle or another barrier in his way to becoming king. So he says, this is something that I must fall down. So this is something that's going to stop him to become king or else overleap. So this is a metaphor for this being a barrier that he either is going to completely stop him or he's going to have to jump over. And this word particularly overleap might be a euphemism for something quite sinister because then he goes on to say stars hide your fires let not light see my black and deep desires and his desires here are to become king to have this ultimate power and his black and they're black and they're deep this has connotations of evil because he's thinking about how he can essentially get rid of Malcolm. The first thing that Macbeth does when he learns that he's been made Thane of Cawdor is write a letter to his wife telling her everything that has happened, everything about the prophecies and the fact that he's been made Thane of Cawdor. And in Act 1 scene 5 is when we first meet this powerful woman, Lady Macbeth, and she reads this letter out loud. And Macbeth calls her my dearest partner in greatness. So dearest, that adjective there, suggests that he loves her. They have a very loving relationship. Partner suggests equality, that their partnership in their marriage and their roles in their marriage quite equal, which would have been very irregular at the time. And greatness suggests ambition. So there's this idea that his wife shares his ambition and she wants to also attain power. And that becomes very, very true as the play um, continues. Later, Macbeth refers to her as my dearest love, which just reinforces this idea that they have a very close relationship. So when looking at the theme of power, we're looking at who has control and legal power in Scotland, 
but also who has the power in relationships. And it's an interesting journey that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth go on in this play in terms of their relationship and who has the power at which point. When Lady Macbeth finishes reading the letter, she delivers her soliloquy, where she expresses her opinions about Macbeth and his potential. And the overarching theme of this soliloquy is that she thinks that he has the potential to be great and attain this power, but he can't do it on his own. And she takes it upon herself to be the person to encourage him to fulfil this potential. She says, yet I do fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness. So she begins to question his masculinity and questions his power as milk links to femininity and maternal instincts as opposed to masculine power. She on, goes on to say, you're not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. So it's interesting that she refers to ambition as an illness. So refers to it in negative terms suggesting that you have to do terrible, sinful things in order to achieve this greatness and attain this power, which Lady Macbeth at this point is more than happy to do. She says that she will have to pour my spirits in thine ear. So she's going to have to talk to her husband and encourage him and tell him what to do her spirits being her ambitions but it also links to witchcraft and the supernatural and it also suggests that Lady Macbeth has a power over her husband so she's able to influence her husband and in order to have the strength to do this she calls on the spirits and she says unsex me here so she wants to be less of a woman and more of a man and this means that she wants to have more masculine qualities. So she wants to be assertive and she wants to have um, the strength to do what she feels that she needs to do or the strength to encourage her husband um, to do these awful things. This dominance that Lady Macbeth seems to have over her husband is reinforced when Macbeth joins Lady Macbeth on the stage later on in the same scene. She uses imperative verbs when talking to her husband, saying, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it and leave the rest to me, which suggests that she has control over the situation. This is not how you would expect a wife to talk to her husband in the 11th century when this was set, but also when Shakespeare was writing in the Elizabethan or Jacobean era. So this would have been a very strange behaviour um, from a lady and the audience, the contemporary audience would have thought that Maybe Lady Macbeth is taking things a step too far uh, in assuming that she has this power over her husband. Later on in this act, in scene seven, it seems that Macbeth isn't keen to go through with their plan of regicide. And for the first time, he really stands up to his wife and he says, we will proceed no further in this business. So it might appear here that Macbeth is taking back control, taking back the power in the relationship. This is not the case, however, because Lady Macbeth retorts with, when you durst do it, then you were a man. So once again, she is questioning his masculinity, but this time she's doing it directly to his face. Now, this is an incredibly bold move on behalf of Lady Macbeth 
And it's a move that works because in the next act, Macbeth murders King Duncan. Once again, the contemporary audience would be really shocked by the attitude that Lady Macbeth has and the seemingly the power she has over her husband. That's it for Act 1. Now what I'd like you to do is pause this video and choose one of the quotations that I've gone over and write one paragraph explaining how this quotation links to the theme of power. See if you can comment on any devices that Shakespeare uses in your chosen quotation or link this quotation to any context or any other links to the wider play. Spend at least five minutes doing that now. On to the key quotations linking to power now in Act 2. In Act 2, Scene 2, Lady Macbeth is the only character on stage and Macbeth is off stage committing regicide. So he's off stage killing King Duncan at this moment. And Lady Macbeth reveals to the audience, I, had lay, I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. So here she's saying that she has put the plan together completely. She put the daggers ready for, so which would be the murder weapon, ready for Macbeth to use so that he couldn't possibly miss them. And so there's no excuses really for him not to commit regicide, not to go through with the plan. But then interestingly, she goes on to say, the reason why she herself did not commit regicide and her excuse is that King Duncan, the sleeping King Duncan, because they decide to kill him whilst he's sleeping, the sleeping King Duncan looked too much like her own father and so she couldn't go through with it. She says, had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Now this might come across as a bit of a weak excuse and maybe she's not as strong and as in control over the situation as she would like us to believe because she is not committing the crime herself. Instead, she is forcing her husband to do this. When Macbeth comes to the stage, once he's finished um, killing the king, he is immediately full of regret and he said that it was a very sorry sight, a very horrible sight to see the king laying there dead. To which Lady Macbeth replies, a foolish thought to say a sorry sight. So Macbeth at this moment is full of remorse, full of guilt, starts to panic and Lady Macbeth is calm and she is resolute and she tells her husband off saying you know you you are being foolish you are being silly to say that this is a bad thing just think about what we can achieve now what will happen now that you've done this thing Macbeth goes on to say that he heard voices so he's continuing on being quite unstable in Act 2, Scene 1, that's when he was hallucinating and seeing the daggers. And he said he heard a voice saying, sleep no more, Macbeth shall sleep no more. Which means that Macbeth will no longer have any peace. And Lady Macbeth gets quite angry with him, saying, in firm of purpose, give me the daggers. So she's losing patience with Macbeth and she's using, she's speaking in short sentences and she's using exclamatory phrases with this exclamation mark and again using imperatives give me the daggers because in Macbeth's panic he brought the daggers the murder weapon back out of King Duncan's bedroom with him and they can't be with Lady Macbeth and Macbeth the murder weapon so she then takes the bloody daggers off Macbeth and places them next to King Duncan's bed so that they are not um, accused or suspects to his murder. 
She says to her husband, my hands are of your colour, but I shame to wear a heart so white. So this line, my hands are of your colour, and a little water clears us of this deed, is a direct link to Act 5, Scene 1, where Lady Macbeth hallucinates herself and she thinks that she sees blood on her hands and she's trying to scrub it off. So this is Shakespeare creating almost a cyclical structure with Lady Macbeth's character. At the beginning of the play, she is strong and powerful and her husband seems to be the weaker one. But by the end of the play, she loses this strength and she hallucinates and eventually commits suicide. Once again, she's questioning his mas masculinity and she's saying she would shame to wear a heart so white. So the colour white has connotations of being cowardly. And so she's basically calling her husband a coward, even though he has, was the one to commit regicide. Moving straight on to Act 3 now. And by this point of the play, Macbeth is, has been made King of Scotland. And you would have thought that he would be happy and content with this power, but he isn't. He is unhappy because he thinks that the power that he currently has is meaningless because it won't last forever. And I don't mean that Macbeth thinks that he himself is going to live forever, but he knows that any sons that he has in the future, because himself and Lady Macbeth do not have any children, will not be crowned kings. Because remember, along with the prophecy that Macbeth would become king, the witches also told Banquo that Banquo's sons will become king, which disrupts this law of primogeniture, where property and position are passed on from father to son. And Macbeth is deeply unhappy about this, which is ironic because he has disrupted this same law by killing Duncan. And because Malcolm and Donalbane, Duncan's sons, fled, Macbeth became king, when really it should have been Malcolm who became king. And now Macbeth fears Banquo. So he fears that his power and position on the throne will be taken away forcefully by Banquo, his best friend, because that is what Macbeth had to do to become king himself. He explains this in the opening line in his soliloquy, to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. And by safely, he means for a long time and for his sons to become king and for there not to be any threat to his power. This could link to an earlier phrase in Act One when Macbeth talks about his vaulting ambition. And the metaphor he uses in Act One talks about the fact that his desire to become powerful, his ambition, uh, doesn't have any solid foundation. And if you vault over something, you jump over it, you are at one point very, very high up in the air um, and then but you must come down. So Macbeth, right from the beginning, has had this fear that his ambition and his uh, want for power will be his undoing. He goes on to say in this soliloquy in Act 3, upon my head they placed a fruitless crown. And this means that he will not be able to have sons that become king. He goes on and continues this idea using the phrase barren scepter in my hand. And then in a really bitter phrase, he says, make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings. So the tone in which this soliloquy is delivered is bitter and full of resentment. And he starts to hate Banquo, even though Banquo has done absolutely nothing. So by this point, even though Macbeth has only just been made king, the power has gone to his head and it's starting to corrupt him. 
He talks about his crown being worthless. And that's something that a king would wear. And also his scepter being empty. And this scepter is a goblet, a go big, big golden goblet that uh, someone royal might drink out of. Which all adds this idea that his current position and power is meaningless to him because he knows that it might be taken away from him at any moment. Banquo also recognises this previously in the same act. So Act 3, Scene 1, Banquo is delivering a soliloquy and he reflects on Macbeth's um, rise to power. And he thinks about the prophecies and he thinks, oh, if this has happened for Macbeth, because Banquo was there when Macbeth heard the prophecies as well, then it might, all the prophecies that the witches told us might come true for me as well. And he echoes what Macbeth says and he says, you know, I myself should be the root and father of kings. But this idea scares Banquo a little bit because he's, he starts to suspect that Macbeth has done something truly evil to uh, become king, to be crowned king. By Act 3, Scene 2, we see a shift in the power dynamics between Macbeth and his wife. By this point in the play, Macbeth has arranged the murder of Banquo and his son Fleance. Lady Macbeth does not know that Macbeth has arranged this. And in this scene, in scene two, Macbeth learns that Banquo was successfully murdered, but that Fleance fled. So Fleance escaped the murderers. I want you to pause the video now and I'd like you to write down the two quotations. We have scorched the snake, not killed it and be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. And before I go over this, these two quotations, I'd like you to have a go at writing down how you think these link to power in the play. I also want you to think about any previous quotations discussed in this video might link to what's being discussed in this scene. So see if you can make links to previous scenes in the play to the quotations on this screen here. Spend about five minutes doing this. In Act 3, Scene 4, the following scene is the famous banquet scene. This is where Macbeth hallucinates and sees Banquo's ghost. It's really important to remember that Macbeth is the only character who can see Banquo's ghost. He is shocked and terrified and starts talking to the ghost, which to everyone else makes Macbeth seem very unsettled, a bit unhinged. And Lady Macbeth is furious with Macbeth and she says, you have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. So mirth here means laughter, broke the good meeting. So we were having a wonderful time until you started babbling away with most admired disorder. This means in such an extravagant way. So she is reprimanding him. She's telling him off for bringing such negative attention upon himself and upon her. She's very aware that as a king and a queen, you have to act in a certain way and you have to be stable and powerful and strong. And Macbeth is acting like someone who is very unsettled. So it makes her look bad as well. She's also worried that Macbeth in his babbling and rambling, he, that he's going to reveal something about their sin in committing regicide. Lady Macbeth realises that the situation cannot be salvaged and she takes it upon herself to dismiss the lords who are gathered round at this feast. She says, at once, good night, stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. So once again, 
Lady Macbeth is using very strong, forceful language. She's using imperative verbs and she's giving orders to Macbeth's men. Because no one else knows what's going on, this would seem as though Lady Macbeth is really overstepping the mark and usurping her husband, the king's power. In Act 4, Macbeth needs some reassurance. His encounter with Banquo's ghost at the banquet has really unsettled him and he feels like he needs more information and answers from the witches. He finds them in their witches' lair and he demands answers from them. And they respond by conjuring three apparitions from their cauldrons. So just imagine from the smoke of a cauldron, three ghost-like beings speak to Macbeth and tell them three new things. The first of which is that Macbeth should be scared of Macduff. They say, Macbeth, 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 beware Macduff. Now, Macbeth doesn't know this at this point, but Macduff is actually in England with Malcolm, who is King Duncan's eldest son. And he and Malcolm are talking about how much of a tyrant, how much of a terrible king Macbeth is, and that they suspect that it was Macbeth who killed Malcolm's father, King Duncan. Then the second apparition says to Macbeth, none of woman born shall harm Macbeth, which gives Macbeth a great sense of false confidence because he assumes from this that no one can harm him. No one can injure him in any way or take away his power because everyone is born from a woman. So once again, the witches or the apparitions are using purposely vague language in order to give Macbeth a full sense of hope here. Because what we actually learn by the end of the play is that Macbeth should indeed beware uh, Macduff because he was born through a caesarean operation so he wasn't physically born from a woman and that's what the witches mean here and they are purposefully misleading Macbeth. And he responds, you know, very arrogantly, very self-assured, then live, Macduff, what need I fear of thee? So this rhetorical question shows that Macbeth is confident and he is rega regaining some of his power. So he was worried when he saw Banquo's ghost, but now that he's heard these two bits of information, he feels um, stronger and more confident once again. And really, he feels invincible. And then Macbeth hears a third thing from the final apparition, which makes him even more confident, because the third apparition says that nothing bad will happen to Macbeth, so no one will take your crown or your power or harm you in any way until Great Burnham Wood, so a forest, a big wood, moves to his castle, to Dunsinane Castle. And Macbeth, and this is impossible, a wood cannot move. So Macbeth believes that this is an impossible thing and that therefore, because it's impossible, it's impossible that his power and his crown will be taken for, away from him. And he says very confident, confidently, that will never be. And he's very assertive with the witches. He wants to know more and more and more because he thinks that knowledge is going to give him power. The more that he knows, the more that he can be prepared. And he uses imperative verbs, so very similar, lang similar language to his wife. Tell me, let me know. Macbeth walks away from the witches and the apparitions, incredibly confident, thinking that he is invincible. Macbeth leaves the witches feeling far more confident. However, he is determined to remove any future threat to his reign and decides to focus on the first apparition who said that he should be scared of Macduff 
And so he decides to eliminate that threat and have Macduff and his entire family murdered. The reason behind this ruthless move is that Macbeth wants to make sure that any of Macduff's children, namely his sons, won't try and avenge their father's death and kill him because he's very, very suspicious, not only of the men who might take over his throne, but also of their sons. So Macduff, uh, sorry, Macbeth says, the castle of Macduff, I will surprise, seize upon Fife. So Macduff is the thane of Fife, Lord of Fife. His wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. So he's saying here, not only am I going to get rid of and kill Macduff, I'm going to get rid of his entire family so that there is absolutely no threat left. And so this really ensures that his power and his reign is long lived without any threat. Now I want you to pause this video just to have a stretch, get a drink. We've got a few more quotations to go and some follow up questions to think about. Almost there. By the end of Act 4, Macduff learns that his entire family has been murdered at Macbeth's hands. And Malcolm is there to console Macduff, but also to rally him against Macbeth. In this line, angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. Malcolm could be talking about his father, the fact that his father was a beloved king, so he was an angel, so he was good and holy and saint-like and bright, that might link to his power or the respect that people had for him. And although he was loved and respected, he fell. And this word here could be a euphemism for his, his murder. However, this line could also be referring to Macbeth. It could be talking about the fact that at the start of the play, Macbeth was respected and was loved certainly by King Duncan because he gave him the um, honour of being Thane of Cawdor as well as Glamis. And by this point, Macbeth isn't dead. However, he has fallen in a way in that he has fallen from grace. He's become this tyrant, ruthless, violent king who no one respects and everyone follows due to fear. Now this could link to the Bible and Lucifer who was an angel at the right hand side of God but became too ambitious and tried to overstep the mark and God banished him from heaven and sent him down to hell. And there he transformed into Satan. So Satan, the devil, is just a fallen angel, Lucifer. So Macbeth in this way could represent Luc Lucifer. Malcolm does not hide his true feelings about Macbeth. He calls him bloody, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every sin that has a name. So this hyperbolic list uh, really showcases how much um, Malcolm hates Macbeth, how little he respects him, and it really, really showcases his anger he has towards Macbeth, the man who he believes killed his father. Malcolm urges Macduff to turn his grief, so the sadness that he has that his family is completely is, are, are all dead, and to convert it to anger. So use the grief and the sadness that you have and use that as fuel to avenge their deaths and to overthrow Macbeth. He continues this metaphor, he says, blunt not the heart, enrage it. So here Malcolm and Macduff are plotting to 
get rid of Macbeth, to take away his power and to dethrone him because they do not think that he is worthy of it. Again, there is irony here because Malcolm and Macduff are doing the very same thing that they are accusing Macbeth of doing. Macbeth committed regicide by killing um, King Duncan and they are plotting to do the exact same thing. So by killing Macbeth, even though they do not feel he is the rightful king, it would still be considered regicide. Or would it? It's more of a moral, ethical problem there. Act 5, scene 1 is a significant moment in the play. It's the final time that Lady Macbeth appears on the stage. And this is when we see this once powerful, assertive, clever, dominant woman has been transformed into a babbling, remorse-stricken wreck. She is walking around in the dark with just a candle, which she calls a taper, and she believes that she can see blood on her hand. And she is furiously trying to clean her hands and remove this blood. This blood, of course, is a symbol and a metaphor for her guilt. And she repeatedly cries out damned spot. So she's referring to the spot of blood that she sees on her hand. And she's also hallucinating and she can see, she thinks that she's talking to Macbeth. And she asks him the rhetorical question, what we need fear, who knows it? When none can call our power to account. So this means who cares what people know about us? We are powerful enough that no one can overthrow us. So she's, this is echoing how she would usually talk to her husband, but really this is her trying to reassure him herself. And she just feels so racked with guilt about what she and her husband did to become powerful, to become king and queen. And she goes on to ask, the Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? And there's real despair in this question because she is referring to Macduff's wife because she's learnt that Macduff's entire family have been killed and she knows or suspects that it's from the, at the hands of her husband and she is fearful perhaps of the man that Macbeth has turned into as much as what she herself has done. This whole time, Lady Macbeth is not on the stage on her own, even though she's talking to herself, because the doctor and her lady-in-waiting are watching her. And the doctor comments that this disease is beyond his practice. That means that there is nothing that he can do uh, to help Lady Macbeth. And it's interesting that he uses this phrase, disease, because this makes us think of when Lady Macbeth first learnt that her husband became Thane of Cawdor and hoped that he become king and she feared that he did not have the illness to attend it. That means that she, she, he wasn't ill enough in his mind, he wasn't ambition, ambitious enough in his mind to actually carry out the deeds that would make him become king. So here maybe Shakespeare is suggesting that too much power or too much ambition is a disease and look what it can do to someone. Shakespeare creates a cyclical structure between this scene and the scene in Act 2 when Macbeth is trying to wash his hands of the real blood uh, that he, can, he has on his hands of Duncan's blood and Macbeth says a little water can clear us of this deed. And here she sees it's going to take a little bit more than a bit of water to cleanse her soul, to ease her conscience. And she really regrets what she did and what her husband did to become king and queen, to have that title and to have that power. In Act 5, Scene 5, Macbeth learns that his wife has committed suicide. But instead of mourning her, he goes on in a very existential manner and reflects on what it is that he has achieved and the meaning of life. 
Macbeth says that life or a person is a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. So he's saying here that life is short, life is but an hour. He's using this metaphor as life as a performance by using this word stage. Shakespeare has used this metaphor in other plays, this metaphor as life as a performance, the fact that we just play different roles through life. And Macbeth is suggesting that what he's turned into isn't really him. He isn't really this tyrannical, violent king. But this ambition and thirst for power, perhaps, has corrupted him and turned him into someone he no longer recognises, perhaps. He goes on to say that it's all full of sound and fury. These are quite hollow nouns. They're not tangible. You can't touch them. They're abstract nouns. So it's full of nothing. It signifies nothing. So he's reflecting on where he is now. He's in his castle. He knows that there's an army approaching and he just is almost in complete despair. He's, he looks like he's about to give up. But maybe perhaps he will throw away his power and he will either run away or he will surrender. And indeed, later on, he says he's trapped. They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly. So he can't escape this. And he quickly regains his old confidence and he says, but words I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by a man that's of a woman born. So here Macbeth is referring to the second of the apparitions who told him that he really shouldn't fear anyone who was of woman born. So he got this sense of invincibility and power back. And this rhyming couplet with scorn and born exemplifies this. In the penultimate scene, Macduff reveals to Macbeth that he was a Caesarean baby. Therefore, he was not of woman born. And he says, Macduff, referring to himself in the third person, was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. At this, there would be gasps of shock from Macbeth, as well as the audience, when they learn that this is the man that's going to finally kill Macbeth. After Macbeth is killed, Malcolm is pronounced king. And Mal Malcolm, being the eldest son of King Duncan, is the rightful heir. So order has restored itself by the end of the play. And Malcolm finally refers to Macbeth as a dead butcher and his fiend-like queen. A fiend is a really negative term, it's like an enemy. So the final speech that Malcolm delivers and the final speech of the play, he's talking about Macbeth in a very negative way. And there's a sense of relief amongst the men, the lords, listening to the now King Malcolm that this tyrannical ruler has finally been vanquished. And that's it. Those are the key quotations from across the play that link to the theme of power. There are now four follow up questions that I'd like you to consider and that would really help you when you come to write your essay. This will be set next lesson. But for now, I want you to think about the following. At what point does Lady Macbeth lose her control and power over Macbeth? So Lady Macbeth is a very powerful woman, but at some point she does lose this control and power. And I'd like you to think about what moment this occurs. Also, I want you to think about how much control the witches have over Macbeth, how much power does do the witches have and therefore how much power does Macbeth ever have? Think about when is Macbeth at the very peak of his power? So when is he most powerful and most in control? Are there several peaks? Are there just is there just one? Is he ever in control? And 
why is this theme of power an interesting theme to think about, considering that this was written for James I? So Shakespeare has James I, the King of England at the time, firmly in his mind when writing Macbeth.